Success for me was being the best tennis player I possibly could be. It wasn't based on, on ranking, it wasn't based on money. It was based on, did I give myself the best opportunity to become the best tennis player I possibly could become? Two mates are on a mission to figure out how 10 Aussie icons in completely different fields broke away from the pack. We want to dig deeper, see if anyone can do what they've done and figure out their common thread. Pat Rafter is one of Australia's most loved sports stars. A former world number one tennis player, he won 11 career singles titles, including two US Opens and a Davis Cup. He also won 10 doubles titles, including the Australian Open, and earned over $12 million in total career prize money. Since retiring, he's been named Australian of the Year, inducted into the International Tennis and Sport Australia Halls of Fame, coached Australia's Davis Cup team, and had centre court of the Queensland Tennis Centre named in his honour. Having locked horns with a feminist writer, Jermaine Greer, in Melbourne, Jack and I headed off to Bondi Beach in Sydney for our last interview of the series with Pat. We wanted to not only explore how he rose to the top of the sport, but to also learn how he's won the hearts and minds of people around the world. Righto, Pat. What motivated you as a tennis player? Well, what motivated me to be a tennis player was to win Grand Slams. What motivated me to be a tennis player when I was young, I just loved the game. I loved how it was, every different shot was a different shot and you had to learn different wind, different ball conditions, different court surfaces, different speeds. Everything was changing the whole time. Never got stale. So for me, I, I was motivated enough to try and master it and see how good I could get at it. But then as a younger player, just say 16 or 17, were you motivated to make a name for yourself? Yeah, I think so. I, I think one of the things that really motivated me was if I could afford my own house, uh, wouldn't that be just great? And that was all I really wanted. I, I grew up with mortgages and things you know, all around you. So you sit there and go, well, I'm gonna try and break free of all that. About, I saw life as having a family, living in a house, and that was, that was all cool. Um, and and if I own my own house, and that was successful. Pat was born in the mining town of Mount Isa in Queensland as the seventh of nine children. He picked up a tennis racket at the age of five and soon had the support of his family around him, helping him realise his natural talents. But it wasn't always easy. I think it was Target, we used to stop in it and get these um, Super 7 shoes. I think they're just plastic shoes, they did pretty well. And... I used to love them. And mum used to make all the, all the clothes up and put little crocodiles on my clothes. Did she really? Yeah, you see To make them look like Lacoste. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> where has your family held you back as a tennis player and where have they helped you along? It's been a, a really remarkable life, mate, that, that I've lived. Now, if I had everything given to me and I came from a very, very wealthy family, you know, I might not have had that drive to play tennis. Um, but what I did have was support from every single one of them. And I had time from my parents amongst all the other kids in the family and an opportunity and positive energy. And I think that's really important, you know. Sometimes you come back and your brothers will slag you off for of being a bit of a prick, but that was all part of it as well. You get a bit of a big head, they'll knock you down. But it wasn't a negative thing, it was just the Australian way. Pat was never known for having a big head. At the age of 19, in 1991, he turned pro and joined the world tour. He won his first tournament in 94 before his breakout year in 97, where he surprised many by winning the US Open. Hey, yesterday our next guest won the uh, US Open the Tennis Championships, earning his first ever Grand Slam title and becoming the tournament's only Australian winner in more than two decades. Here he is. Your 1997 U.S. Open champion, Patrick Rafter. Patrick. Yeah, where were you ranked before the tournament? Uh, 14. 
14th. Yeah, uh -huh. 14th. So well, that's pretty good, though, to be 14th. Yeah, it was great for me. At the, I mean, it's a, my highest ever ranking, and I was very happy being there. And, uh -huh. uh, but I never would have dreamed I'd ever be three in the world. Yeah. So then, uh, Ted, when did you sort of start to get the feeling, geez, things might go my way here? Um, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> He would follow up again in 1998 to win six tournaments for the year, claiming another US Open victory, beating fellow Aussie Mark Philippoussis in the final. Pat was known for his unique playing style of attacking the net and for his sportsmanship. His good looks and down-to-earth personality resonated with fans the world over. How important were other people in your life to your success and, and why were they important? Uh, well, I, I guess a lot of that comes into tennis coaching and, and because a tennis coach has become your, your, your mentors as well. I was around really good people as well and I felt like I was learning from each of them. I felt like I had more, a lot of coaches along the way that really helped. Hello? Will you accept a reverse charge call from Tony Roach? Is it 1-800-REVERSE? No. Sorry. Dedicated your 1998 US Open victory to Tony Roach. Could you have done it without him? Oh, probably. You know, because I always feel like you'll find a way. But Rochi is like a father figure to me as well. That's an in interesting question. I've never had that question asked to me before. Very difficult answer. But, but someone like Rochi and I, we, we trained and we worked hard together for so many years. And we had such a great relationship that at the time he was very instrumental to my success. It was with the support of his family and surrounding himself with quality people that Pat would shoot to number one in the world rankings in 1999. That same year, he won the Australian Open doubles and contributed to the Davis Cup victory, but missed the final due to injury. His shoulder injury problems also forced him to bow out of his US Open defense that year. After surgery on his shoulder, he came back to form, beating some of the greats, making two Wimbledon finals, coming runner-up on both occasions in some classic contests. Eventually, injuries caught up with him, and Pat retired from the game in 2002 at the age of 28. How did you handle setbacks in your career? You're going to have wins, but you're going to have a lot of losses, and that's part of the game. Every week, you're, getting, you're losing pretty well. So if you're not going to get used to it, don't play the game. Get used to it. Do you have to be obsessive about what you're doing to be successful? I think to a degree you have to have it. I think it's important to have balance though. And I was someone who looked at a bigger picture of what happens when I finish my career, what happens with my life. I never wanted to be someone who was so caught up in the, the tiny little world of the tennis reality that it was going to affect everything else that happens around the world. So, I know what you're saying, but it's a, I was never someone who was totally focused and that was all I was going to do, but it still was my first priority. So I, I felt like I struck a bit of a balance. And Pat did strike a balance. When his successful tennis career was cut short due to injury, rather than fade into the background, He's put his likeable personality out there by continuing to promote brands and support causes he cares about. He's been the ambassador for Bond's underwear for the better part of a decade, and over the years has endorsed brands like Dove for Men, Lay's Chips, Mantra Hotels, Kia Motors, and Reebok. He's also supported the Starlight Foundation helping hospitalized children, spoken out against the factory farming of animals, and to this day, supports other causes through various charity matches. And he's a natural on camera, so why wouldn't he? When I was asked to talk about new comfy Bond sports socks, I thought, great, no more standing around my undies. <clears throat> we were interested to hear his perspective on forging a name for himself. I think I was at a time where um, there weren't a lot of players around. I came on the scene, I won a couple of slams, and then I was sort of revered a little bit more than, than if, if I'd won that back in the 70s. You know, he would have just gone, there's another, another good tennis player from Australia. 
maybe the personality or the media sort of made me into something bigger than what I actually was. That's okay. Pat's known for his humility, but this point about the media making him into something bigger than what he was got us thinking. In true Pat style, we reckon he undersold his ability to manage the media and use it to his advantage. Like we heard with the other Aussie icons, like Jerry Harvey, who's been able to leverage the press to promote his business, and Jessica Watson, who shared updates of her adventure through her blog, we reckon Pat's been the master of engaging with the media and getting himself out there. He hasn't played tennis at the top level in years, and yet he's still relevant. There's a bit of magic about the way he carries himself. Pat, you're one of Australia's most loved sportsmen. Have you found the public life rewarding? Yeah, mate, I, I've had really good positive feedback from the public. I always try and be pretty honest with them and, and I try and stick pretty close to my morals that I have brought up by my parents. And if I stick to those morals and try and just be normal, live a normal life, um, I find that the public really liked it. I had to be careful. There was one or two occasions where I had to work at it, of making sure that if there's bad or negative publicity, try not to be too hard on that person, ask them and talk to them, and then you can turn media around. And once you've got the media on your side, it's very hard for them to write a negative article about you because everyone will say they'll bag that person. You know, um, so I, I try to be honest. And I, you know, every now and then I, st I stuff up like everyone does, and I am in the spotlight a lot more than probably the general person. And I'm not against that. It, it is. I prefer if I didn't have it, but if I didn't have it, I wouldn't also live the lifestyle I have. So you can't, you can't cut something off and, and, and abuse one side of it and say I want this because it sort of goes hand in hand. The media have, have built up my profile. And with that comes endorsements and sponsorships, etc. So I've always felt that my relationship with the media has been really good and really positive. I'll be honest with them and they can be honest with me and it works well. Pat is an Australian sporting legend. He reached the top of a competitive international sport, but he's also been successful off the court, leading an active public life ever since. We reckon this is in large part down to his skills of self-promotion. He's a master of the media game and taught us that you've got to actively manage the media to amplify your message. Everyone we met seemed to understand this thread. Jack and I originally set off on our mission to meet these 10 Aussie icons from different fields because we had two unanswered questions. The first was whether there was a common thread that ran through each of their diverse stories. And we really feel we answered this. Yes, there is a common thread. All these people dreamt big, and where so many of us are held back for whatever reason, these people just dived in and went for it. They were independent thinkers who backed themselves, didn't let the naysayers get in their way, and achieved incredible things, inspiring people the world over. The second question we wanted answered was whether anyone could do what they've done. And we reckon the answer to this is also yes. Whether it was reaching the top of investment banking or the legal profession, saving people's lives and founding multi-billion dollar companies, or sailing around the world, training horses, starting revolutions, pioneering genres, and winning trophies. All these Aussies were just ordinary people, but they'd made the decision to go and do extraordinary things. Thank you very much for your time today. There's a, there's a gift there for you. You're just a bit of fish oil, so uh, you can never have enough of it. I was taking a lot of um, fish oil, and I'm now on the chai powder, which has more omega-3s than any of this. Is that right? Yeah, and I need some down here. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Oh, that's great, Pat. Thanks so much.